Well, thank you, uh, Dean Short, and uh, good morning, excuse me, Dean Flynn uh, and uh, Assistant Dean Short. I, uh, I'm real happy to be here with you. I listened to a few thoughts. Uh, you know, let's start this way, since we're all in social work in the room here. Uh, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're Mexican named Leroy, you know you're in trouble to begin with. And, and uh, there's a conflicting uh, personality that you got to deal with. Uh, and growing up in East Los Angeles uh, with the last name of Baca in Japanese, we had Japanese kids over there. Uh, Baca means stupid in Japanese, so... <laughs> when, you, uh, when you're called stupid Leroy, that kind of gets you started the right way with uh, understanding life is going to be challenging. And my grandparents that raised me were uh, country western music fans, and so we used to listen to country western music all the time and, uh, in those days. And in El Monte, there was the El Monte Legion Stadium, and then we had Cliffy Stone's hometown jamboree. So if any of you like country western music, then you're stuck with a sheriff that's Mexican named Leroy with country western music, okay? <laughs> And so it's really exciting to share this time with you because I want to emphasize how important you are uh, to not only this county and Orange County and any other part of the world that you choose to work in, but the United States is an amazing place. Uh, every day I just sit back and think about how wonderful it is to live here uh, and how we here in Los Angeles County, 10 million people, the largest county in the United States. This county, by the way, is larger than 42 states in the United States in terms of population. You know, and when people talk about California's economy being the fifth largest in the world, Los Angeles is the ninth largest in the world. And so California as a state wouldn't be much of anything without Los Angeles as far as the economic success story. But what I also think is fascinating about Los Angeles County is that we are the diversity capital of the world. We have every religion. I'm glad that uh, Rabbi Stein is here. He was gonna, you might hear from him at a later point. But I think what's exciting about this is that all, all nationalities, all languages, uh, all people of all nations uh, are living here. And I think that this becomes uh, what I see as the beginning point, significantly the beginning point uh, for the world to understand that whatever is going to happen in their parts of the world, I don't care where you go, you might have to come to Los Angeles to learn how we do it here so that everybody can work and coexist safely and have a sense of purpose and have the things that all of us want in life, and that's a better life. But social work is what I do. Five or six years ago, when I was the only elected official that said we have to do something about the homeless problem instead of put them in jail, no one else was dealing with this issue. People gave up on the issue. The issue became something that was a pariah because nimbyism is real. People don't want their property values to go down. Now, I, I know what it's like to live in, 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 a, in a poor neighborhood, but I also know what it's like to live in a fluent neighborhood, so I'm not trying to give you a sor sorrowful story here. Uh, what I'm trying to say to you is that we have a lot of needs, human needs, and that means that you have a real big job to perform, but so do I. And I've always said that those of us in law enforcement are social workers that this is nothing other than a specialized form of social work, that we're in everyone's homes for a variety of reasons, domestic disputes uh, within the home, conflicts in the neighborhood, uh, the situation of gangs. Uh, I was pleased 30 years ago, God, it's been a long time, but to teach in a junior high school uh, a, a class called Student of the Law. Teaching in a classroom is another aspect of social work. And I taught uh, at uh, Fay Ross Junior High School in Artesia. I taught at Carson High School two hours a day, uh, Monday through Friday, on a part-time basis. I taught at East Los Angeles Garfield High School in the adult school. Now, these were people that didn't succeed in their normal high school 
period of time, and so they went to adult school to kind of catch up and get a GED. And I did this because, like you, I'm interested in how people become who they are. This is one of the more interesting things if you want to be a social worker. Uh, you have to have some kind of interest as to how do people become what they are. Why do some people make it in life and why do some people not make it in life? Why do some people have the ability to survive any condition and some people are always bouncing around and having difficulty no matter what it is? And some of you know that with your brothers and sisters, if you grow in a home that's uh, grow up in a home that has, you know, more than one child, that some children do a lot better than other children. You wonder what, why you have got the same parents, you got the same home, you eat the same food. But why? Why do some of us as human beings have more difficulty with the miracle of life? Well, I'm going to try and get you something a little different, and I'll shut up, and then you can ask a question or two. I want you to have an experience here with me because I know this is the last time we're going to see each other in this sense, the first time and last, so I want to take full advantage of this opportunity to say something important to you. I want you to know why it's important to be a social worker. Now, a lot of us have our own particular religion, and I'd like to ask in the room, are any of you of any particular religious belief? And if you just raise your hand, I'm not asking which, I'm just saying if you have a religious belief, would you please raise your hand? Okay, thank you. Uh, for those that haven't made up their mind yet, maybe what I have to say might help you in some respects, because I think you have a lot of faith as well. To me, the universe is perfect. To me, uh, the idea that we don't know where it is in terms of its finished point, it, we, we just can't find the answer to how far out it goes. We will never know. That's how magnificent the universe is. And then the fact that we have uh, stars and planets and those sort of things. I mean, how many of them out there? Do you think we're ever going to count them all? I want to know who thinks we're going to count them all. <laughs> well, we're not going to count them all. There are things we just don't know. That's how big this universe is. But then we got this little place called Earth. Now, those of you that believe in God as I do and the religious uh, tenets that you believe in, that I believe in, do you really think that whoever our God is is paying attention to how many times the Earth circles the sun? Do, do you think God's time is the Earth circling the sun? We don't know what time really is all about because the universe is so vast and so old and so ancient and yet so young that at the same time whatever it took to get this place that you and I live to be what it is today or to be what it was three or four hundred years three or four hundred thousand years ago when human beings were first able to be introduced here that we somehow are part of a grand plan of some type from somewhere, and I don't know any more than that. And so it's so perfect that you and I can breathe, you and I can drink water, that water has purpose for us, air has purpose for us, your body has purpose for you as it does for me, and we have this sense of being alive. Now, to me, I don't need to know why I hear, although I'm learning it. I don't need to know why I touch. I don't need to know why I can see. Now, do you see with your eyes or do you see with your brain? Who wants to take a guess here? You see with your brain. Your eyes are the vessels to your brain through the nerves that allow your brain to see. Okay? The point then is that your brain is probably the most perfect creation of all the creations. And it is as infinite as that universe is that I alluded to earlier. The question is, since God's only given you 80 years or more, I'm kind of bumping it up a little bit, to be on this earth, what are you going to do with that brain that you wholly 
own that is wholly yours to explore and to develop. What are you going to do? So the first thing a social worker should understand, in my opinion, is how they learn. How you learn as an individual is critical to how you're going to experience the short 80 years, which in God's time, my friends, in the universe's time, in contrast to God's time, in earth time, you and I, in God's time, are living here in probably one second. One second. That's how short it is. Thus, through that reality that I take into myself, now I didn't need to be a Christian to come to this conclusion. I didn't need to be a Jew. I didn't need to be a Muslim. I didn't need to be any religion. All I'm trying to do is use my mind and my senses and whatever tools the God gave me and gave you. I'm trying to make some sense in the simplest of ways. That there is a miracle in each and every one of us. And therefore, if you're going to be an effective social worker, the more you respect your miracle, you can help others who do not respect their miracle learn how to respect their miracle. And this is how I approach it in my job, that America is the greatest experiment of human acceptance. All other nations do not have the track record that this great country has about human acceptance. And human acceptance is what this world needs more than any other thing. And I think that we are obligated as human beings to cherish someone else's humanity in addition to our own. And I see it everywhere, in federal politics, national politics, in looking at leaders all over the world. I have a radar for those in power that will divide someone out of the family of life. And my job, because I've got a little power, is to make them wrong. That you should never divide out from yourself God's creations. And what I find challenging, and I'll just get it to you and then we'll get on with, with the questions, is this. America has a constitution. America has Bill of Rights. And America has civil rights. At the same time, America stole people from a continent under the legal, legal opportunity for slavery. This is not a good thing, folks. The America history is still not reverberated from that very, very bad decision. The early descendants that came here from England had an attitude about the Irish attitude that they operationalized, and it still has some conflicting realities in that part of the world between Ireland and Great Britain. Now, you add a little more complication when the Italians decide to get on over here, and we're going to have a little more conflict here between cultures and languages. And who here in this room has never heard a joke about an Italian? And then you got the Polish rolling over, and then you got the French coming over, and now we even have... Uh, if certain nations' leaders don't do what America wants, we have a sense of uh, outrage uh, about the French. Although at the same time, uh, we're, some of our Congress members are changing French fries into something else, kind of freedom fries. Now, let me tell you, the Statue of Liberty didn't just arrive there on its own. America was losing the Civil War excuse me, was losing the war of independence against Great Britain. Washington's armies were from the states. They weren't paid for the most part. They were dying more of malaria and illnesses from the exposure than they were the bullets of the Brits. 
Benjamin Franklin was in France for several years trying to convince uh, the rulers there to send the French army to America, and the French relented to the persuasion and sent their armies over here, and the end of the history is, is that the British got defeated because the French were here to defeat them, and therefore our nation became an independent and sovereign nation because of France. We have no business picking on the French people at all for whatever's going on in the world of affairs. We wouldn't be America without France. So here's the thing. Then we imported Chinese to build railroads and gave them places to live, not so that people could order in the restaurants, number one, two, or three. It was because that was the only place they were allowed to live. No right to vote, no right to marry, no right to become a citizen, uh, and you certainly couldn't own any land. And then we had a great idea that all men are created equal, but women weren't able to vote until around 1915. And when Congress finally passed a law that said all women now will get to vote, it was by one Congress member, and that Congress member, a male, was kicked out of office the following election period because of that one vote that tipped the scale in favor of women. Now, I got some news for you folks. I love America. And then we decided during World War II the Japanese ought to be interned because uh, we, you know, they, we can't quite trust them to any great extent. Now, this is all facts, and I'm not trying to bring this out to make anyone feel bad here. I'm just trying to say that everyone who's ever been a part of this great experience, including the Indians, have been discriminated against. White, black, brown, Asian, African American, the, the country has a rich history of discrimination. Now, the question is, what are you going to do? Cry about it? You know, are we going to just sit here and, and mope about the fact that we don't like our particular uh, experiences in America? No. We are going to take advantage of the fact that in spite of that troublesome past, that we're in the 21st century, and this is what I want to say to you about law enforcement. 21st century law enforcement says it's no longer acceptable to carry on the prejudiced policies of America's laws that are so screwed up in history at times that we have to do it the right way for everybody. That it's not acceptable to do certain things that hurt human beings. That values mean something in the sense of what enforcement is. And that's why I changed the core values in the Sheriff's Department because the one thing that law enforcement doesn't do is it doesn't train itself to be leaders first then law enforcement second. And I believe that leadership is now the new message for everybody, including social workers. Social workers are leaders. Teachers are leaders. Anyone that wants to assume a leadership role can assume a leadership role. What is that? The fact that you can extend a hand of support to someone to lift them up to a higher place is an act of leadership. The social work in itself needs to embrace a greater vision that will lift the position of a social worker to a point of high respect. That there is no higher calling than to be someone like a minister in a church or a rabbi or teacher. There is no higher calling than to be a social worker who is a teacher. Teaching what? Teaching people how to repair themselves. Teaching people to have better hope. Teaching people to have confidence that they can overcome their difficulty. Now, I wasn't kidding when I said stupid Leroy here earlier. When I graduated from East Los Angeles College, I had a 2.0 grade point average. Now, that's a hard thing to do, folks. One D. <laughs> It is. One D and you're out. You don't graduate. And then uh, one B uh, and then you're a little bit above the 2.0 line. So that's a record. I, 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 I'm not proud of it. It's just a fact. But then I went to Cal State LA and, and straightened it out. It took me 11 years to get a bachelor's degree. But I came over to the great University of Southern California. 
You know? In fact, my high school, Franklin High School in Highland Park, only two, only two of us got doctorate degrees, me from USC, the other guy went to Canada. But the, the point is, is that I don't think he wanted to do Vietnam, but, but uh, that's another story. But he, he was a student body president, I was a senior class president. We both had 2.3 grade point averages out of high school, which doesn't speak well for my success academically. Uh, but the point of all that is that there's only two subjects I excelled in, and that was English, math, algebra, and, ge and, and that side of it, the two major subjects of learning. And, and then finally I got real on, on college at Cal State LA and cleaned myself up. So when I took the GR, when I took the GRE to get into USC's master's program, uh, I scored high. You know, it's all quantitative analysis and language interpretation and language skills. So I scored extremely high. And then I, I had like a 2.8 at the time, you know, in the applications process. So they kind of felt sorry for the guys and let him in. <laughs> but uh, then I went after that doctorate degree and it took me until I was 51 years of age to finish. I mean, I had kids in the class like you, you know, they were wondering, what's this old guy doing in here? Well, the point of that little story is this, that the concept of growth in human life is what you as social workers have to be the experts in. That when a person is stunted and stopped and turned around and somewhat gives up on themselves, your leadership is going to be the key that gets them believing that they can do it again. And I'm a very big believer it's not so much what you do with success that makes you an extraordinary person. It's what you do with failure. It's how intelligent do you respond to your failures in this world. If you repeat those failures over and over and over again, you pretty much have given up. And so I'm hopeful that what I say to you makes sense. I'll recite the core values of the Sheriff's Department just so you get it. And everyone is required to remember them by heart. I've trained close to 4,500 new deputies, so it's half the force. We operate under these core values. I think you need to have your core values as social workers. And if you hold to those core values, there will be a guiding force for you. So here they are. As a leader in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, I commit myself to only perform my duty with respect for the dignity of all people. The integrity to do what is right and fight what is wrong. Wisdom to apply common sense and fairness in all that I do. And courage to stand against racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and bigotry in all its forms. That's what law enforcement should represent everywhere in America. And finally, I believe in transparency. I'm in the work, and you're in the same work, of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you know what? Don't be afraid of any of it. And say what it is. And don't be afraid of being criticized for whatever criticism requires. And if you can take it that way, you will say that America, Los Angeles County, diversity capital of the world, you will say that wherever you are, you are mindful that human beings, each and every one, those of us that are short, tall, don't like how we look, or like how we look, or would prefer to look like somebody else, or whatever it is, no matter what you think of who you are, that you are a miracle. Thank you.
Okay, anybody have any questions? Thank you for your nice applause, by the way. <laughs> Got a question right here? Yes, ma'am. presided over the Long Beach can everyone hear me the judge who presided over the Long Beach trial uh, regarding the Halloween uh, beatings of three Caucasian women um, the judge ordered uh, community service 250 hours of community service and uh, 90 hours of, or 90 days of house arrest uh, to the uh, alleged perpetrators and I'm wondering what this legal precedent does for law enforcement uh, in terms of promoting racial tolerance among youth in communities? It's hard to say. You know, I want to be blunt about it. You know, it's a very difficult case. Uh, the judge listened to all the facts. You know, we have to think about that. Made a bold decision. Uh, recognized uh, that it was a terrible thing to have happen. Uh, and I believe that uh, all of us learned more than we actually uh, realized. Uh, we're never going to agree with how that case was resolved. I think there are people on one end of it and on another end. Uh, suffice to say, uh, I'm not going to say that uh, the victims feel that they had justice. I'm, I, I, I imagine they don't. And, and I believe that the perpetrators uh, didn't realize that individually they lost themselves. And uh, if there was just one child out there that was a perpetrator alone, it would never happen. Uh, but you get a group, and all of a sudden there's a spontaneous action. Uh, they lost themselves. Uh, and I think the uh, judge uh, took a step uh, in a direction that says uh, either you put them in jail or you make them learn how to find themselves. And I think that uh, the goal uh, of justice uh, obviously is often uh, hard to find, uh, especially for a victim. I mean, I'm a very, very big uh, believer uh, in rehabilitation, uh, intervention, and we do a lot in the jails that I'd like Ramona here to talk about the good things instead of the overcrowdedness, but she'll talk about good stuff too, I'm sure. Uh, this is Ramona Ripson here from the ACLU. Uh, and I'm a big supporter of the ACLU, but they sure give me headaches, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I have plenty of aspirin, so I don't need to worry about that. Uh, I know I'm not giving you a hard answer, but uh, I just say that justice is very, very difficult. Now, the Muslims believe in peace, love, and justice, and I say we can all agree with what peace is, we can all agree with what love is, but we cannot agree with what justice is. Yes, sir, over there. <laughs> yeah? Actually being sarcastic, but... Uh, it's okay. I, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of preachers named Leroy. <laughs> <laughs> but my thing is that um, as social workers, one of the things that we're... Um, um, ta is preventive uh, measures and I know that right now we have many problems that are involved that law enforcement, is, law enforcement is involved in one of the more recent not recent but one of the one that has been getting the most attention right now is um, gangs the increase in gangs mm -hmm. and I believe that there's an international conference yes um, I just that, came from there yeah that, that was that's taking place today and I just want to know what is the preventive measures that law enforcement or that you suggest using the core values that you have yes. um, to dealing with problems of gangs, police brutality, harassment, racial profiling. Um, what are the pre preventive measures using the core values and not just dealing with the problem with the problem when it happens? All right, very good question. I uh, uh, we have a VITA program, a Vital Intervention Directional Alternatives program, uh, and it's a 16-week Saturday program. And it's basically taking uh, a youngster who has dropped out of school or gotten in a little trouble with the superior court, the juvenile court, or their parents are, you know, not knowing what to do, which is a big part of the problem, too. And then uh, the schools identify them. So it's all day Saturday, and we have deputies there with volunteers from the community. 
Uh, we have some money from the shift cardinus dollars. These are intervention dollars that come from the state. Uh, shift and cardinus are two elected officials that sponsor legislation. And we are essentially uh, saying that uh, through intervention, we can help turn these children around. And we do. Uh, and we're the only law enforcement agency in the nation that does this at a pinpointed way, saying we're going to take the kids that are troubled with school and home and life, and we're going to help them build their confidence and get them back to school and get them understanding how to solve problems with their parents. And a lot of the parents, and we do parenting classes as well for the parents, a lot of the parents are very, very, very unprepared to be parents, and they need their help too. Uh, and we therefore intervene in that fashion. But I'm very proud of Coach Pete Carroll because he approached me five years ago and said, I can help too. And, and he introduced me to the Pacific Institute. Uh, the Pacific Institute, Lou Tice, the executive director and founder. Uh, they have an, a, a, a program, a curriculum. It's an educational program that I've embraced. And we've trained over 500 people to be mentors and tutors. And the whole theory of gang intervention, from what I see, is this. It's all about taking a person from one level of thinking to a more effective level of thinking. It's all about what's in that head of yours. And, and gang members get bounced around from negative experiences at home, negative experiences at school, negative experiences on the street, and then they run into coalescence of what a gang is, and all the gang is is just another form of a negative experience under some umbrella of support and love. And the reality is that it's not going to make you a successful adult. It's just going to make you a person who can't solve problems effectively. So those are the things we're doing. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, we're arresting a lot of people at the same time because I'm not one that's going to put up with some homeboy with a gun walking down the street acting like he can blow somebody off because they're African American or whatever race they don't like. And, you know, these are, these are people with dangerous tools in their hands, a dangerous mind with a dangerous gun, with a dangerous tool and a dangerous opportunity. They belong in jail. We'll fix them in jail. We'll re rehab them in there, but they belong in jail. Yes, in the back. enforcement a place where I would operate as a social worker so just as an education maybe you can tell us what types of roles can social workers play in law enforcement just to give us an idea well I think Dean Flynn really spoke well about when social workers were required to ride with police officers and be a part of their environment I would love to have uh, opportunity to explore with the school interning some of you into the Sheriff's Department. And, and I can say uh, that will happen if you so desire, because that's one great thing about being a sheriff. <laughs> if I say this is what we're going to do, I can assure it will get done. Uh, I also would like to share with you that I believe that some of you should be employed by the Sheriff's Department. That it isn't merely an experience of education, but it should be an experience of responsibility. And, and if I grow out more of my intervention side uh, with more money that I'm begging for, I would like to see more social workers literally working as professionals in the Sheriff's Department. Thank you very much. One of your uh, groups of progressive leaders about homelessness made me sign something, and I'm just going to tell you what I signed. I, as Sheriff Lee Baca, pledge to be champion for California Senate Bill Number 2. As Sheriff of Los Angeles County, I witnessed the effects of homeless has on police enforcement. Criminalizing the homeless will not alleviate the problem. The state of California is paying $64 a day to incarcerate a homeless person in jail. 
$85 a day in prison. Providing shelter for the homeless will cost only $37 a day. In valuing the inherent dignity of each human being and remaining dedicated to the best interests of the County of Los Angeles, I publicly support and encourage the passage of Senate Bill Number 2. Leroy Baca, Sheriff, Los Angeles. Thank you.